Yes. Medicaid Thank you all for joining like us. I appreciate it. Let's send the seminal. children. Let's start with no one thought that 95% of the money was going to say no. preschool legislation, what are some of the markers of, of success that you were, were looking for? Yeah. yeah. Sure. Well, uh, first I wanted to pass it. I mean, that was kind of like the important thing. Um, yeah. You know, pre-K yeah, education. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so uh, you in the see state you of here, Texas, uh, it's been around a long time, and, and what was interesting is that there's a lot of garbage noise around uh, what was happening with pre-K um, at a federal level, which I'm sure this is something that we will talk about, uh, and what the ideas of the current administration has on that. But it, it got a little it got a little confusing with people because they thought, oh, here here we go, we're going to put universal pre-K in the state of Texas. Oh, this is horrible and and, um, and unfortunately, in, in the state of Texas, uh, a lot of people don't read the bills, um, including many of my colleagues, and uh, they didn't understand what was in the bill. So the reality was is that pre-K already existed in Texas. A half a K pre-K would already exist for about 50% of the population. And we're spending, oh, by the way, about $800 million a year on it. And when the governor came to me, uh, we had some ideas on pre-K, but when the governor came to me and said, look, we want to work on this, uh, and I want a high quality pre-K program and keeping in mind this was the number one emergency item for him so it was the number one priority for him is right. pre-k education and so we wanted to look at it and say you know what it, what it, what has to go into the mixing bowl to make sure that it goes well and and you know we looked at it and say you know making sure that we get uh, some results and we're not talking about standardized tests or anything like that we're talking about making sure that they're following the TEKS uh, making sure that we got good quality teachers in the in the program because in some cases they don't have the qualified teachers in there, and, and regardless of what people say, you know, the, 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 the teaching of those kids, you have to have qualified teachers in there, so we wanted to make sure that we had that uh, associated with that. Uh, measuring it, you know, some of the things that got into the bill, we can talk about it later, some other things that got in there. Um, but really just kind of looking at the results, where are we spending the $800 million on? Is it daycare, or is it actually, are they learning something? And we wanted to make sure that they were learning something. So that was kind of the starting point. And Dr. Doggett, I'd love to go to you next. When we're looking at the national level, there's been a, a push to expand pre-K. Not all of these programs look the same, and I don't think that the government is saying they all need to look the same, but what are some of the critical components for making sure that kids are learning? Great. Well, first I want to thank you, Emily, and thank the Atlantic and Heising Simons for doing this, and my colleagues in San Antonio who've done an amazing job with Pre-K for SA, and Kathy Brook, who's led the effort. She's done an incredible job. Uh, we're trying to back you up at the national level. We think it's important for the federal government to work with state governments, to work with local governments, to make sure that every environment that children are in, whether it's home, it's a child care center, or it's a pre-K center, and in beginning at birth, uh, is a learning center. I think for so long we've said, this is child care, this is Head Start, this is preschool, and we haven't realized that for children it doesn't make any difference. They all need stimulating, exciting, hands-on, active learning environments from birth on. And so at the federal level, uh, the president has come out very strong uh, for preschool for every four-year-old, not just those at risk, because every four-year-old needs to go to preschool. Uh, we want to work with states to build that, because you're right, there's not one size fits all. But we also know that kids get to preschool behind. And we need to do more for infants and toddlers and for three-year-olds. And so we've done that through increasing funds for Head Start. There's a new Head Start Child Care Partnership, which is increasing the quality for infant care. Uh, but we need to do a lot more because we're only getting started. Right. And Mr. Perez, for many of the cities and states looking at expanding pre-K, buy-in from businesses has been critical, but it hasn't always been easy to secure. And I would love to hear you talk about that a little bit and, and how you're kind of selling this to businesses. Sure. Well, thank you, Emily. Um, I will tell you, indeed, it was a hard sell, but I think that our former mayor, Julian Castro, was very smart in uh, assembling a group of business leaders, community leaders, uh, individuals that... Uh, he assembled and said, we have an eighth of a cent sales tax left. We want to maximize its use. What is the best and highest use of that dollar to enhance the opportunity for this community long term? And after months of very serious analysis, visiting other communities around the country, bringing in experts, uh, the panel landed on high quality, full day pre-K as the best opportunity for a city like San Antonio to take our citizens to the next level. 
And again, it was a hard sell. We had to then be convinced as a business community, as a chamber of commerce, uh, that this made sense. But after we peeled the onion back, it was pretty clear that the evidence uh, was very clear that having a, again, high quality, full day pre-K program made sense. And, and skip forward now to uh, today, and I'm on the board actually of Pre-K for SA, kind of as a watchdog, if you will, from the business community. And I'm even more convinced now that uh, the work that we're doing uh, as a board and the quality of education that these young, uh, young ones are getting is the best and is going to be, I think, long-term excellent for the community. Councilman, you, you've been backing Pre-K for SA, but do we have a sense really yet of how the program is going? Well, indeed, the program is going uh, as expected. Uh, in some quadrants, it's exceeding expectation. But I think the one that uh, is of best interest to all of us, I think we can all recognize that we've got to select the right children, and that's pretty well predetermined, right? I mean, the you know, kids that are at risk and the like. Uh, we also have to make sure that we have the best teachers and we have hired master teachers and folks that are being, uh, you know, caring and have the ability to deliver what we want. The key really to the success of this program is really on the parents, the parent engagement. I think that's what's going to give us the sense of success and continued success, because it's not only for the one child that we have in our classroom for that year, it's the children in that family that come behind them that we have now taken that parent and made them an engaged parent. That's going to be the measurement of success. We're going to measure success by virtue of test scores, uh, performance in classrooms, and things of that nature. But as a society, what we have to do is measure what the level of engagement is from our parents, because that's going to be, quite honestly, all of us that are in education or uh, in government or uh, in municipal or state, federal government can only do so much. It has to happen at the family unit. It has to happen with that level. So I think it's that third leg of the stool, and that's the parent, the parent involvement and engagement, continued engagement is going to be the measurement for success. It seems like that is a critical component of this pre-K for SA, that there are some wraparound services being provided at these centers where parents are involved, they may come for health care, they, they're encouraged to volunteer, so I, it does seem like it's a priority here in San Antonio. But um, Dr. Doggett, I'd love to go back to you for a moment. Dale Farron out of Vanderbilt has done some research where she doesn't necessarily suggest that preschool is a bad investment, but she suggests that we don't necessarily know it's a good investment, especially for poor children. And I'd love to, to get your response on that. Well, I hope everybody looks at that study because I think it is a wake-up call for all of us. Uh, it shouldn't be ignored. It really needs to be used as a, a call to, for action. Uh, what happened in Tennessee is they didn't tend the program well enough. They didn't have a feel, a feel for what direction. They didn't, they didn't make sure that there was continuous quality improvement. They didn't have families engaged as we have in San Antonio. And they, so they didn't put in place the quality the continuous quality improvement that was needed, uh, and I think that was a problem. We do know that preschool works, but there are a lot of buts. But it only works if it's high quality and you've got to have continuous quality improvement. You've got to fund it better. You've got to have the high quality teachers that we've talked about. In Texas, we have a problem because we have a pre-K to sixth grade certification, certificate. So someone who wants to teach, thank you. So someone who wants to teach sixth grade, sixth grade is very different from pre-K. And in pre-K, we want kids doing active learning. And so if we have a certificate that's P through six, it puts a whole lot of pressure on the school district to go and get the pre-K teachers the, the training that they need instead of asking universities and the state to change the system and let's make sure that, that our, our teachers are coming out of their university, four years of a university, or, or even getting a master's with the skills they need to walk right in to a preschool classroom. So they didn't have the quality improvement that they needed in place. The other thing we need to talk about is you've got to have good kindergarten, first and second, third grade. And we've ignored those, really kindergarten, first and second grade, because those kids weren't tested in those grades. And we put the quality teachers up in third and fourth grade where kids are getting tested. We're sending a better product to the kindergarten. The kindergarten is repeating what they've done before because they were getting kids that hadn't been to pre-K. 
So we've got to change the kindergarten and first and second grade curriculum and make sure that they're strong. And I don't mean worksheets. I mean, I can see I have a lot of people who know developmentally <laughs> appropriate practice. We don't mean worksheets. We mean hands-on, active, deep learning because we know kids are eligible, able to do that and we want to see pre-K, but we want to see better um, programs up the line, and then we talked a little bit about we want to do more for the infants and toddlers. Right. And Representative Huberty, is that something that the state is, is looking at, facilitating more continuity between pre-K and, and K-12? Yeah. I mean, if you think about what we did last session, <clears throat> excuse me, um, you know, we weren't even requiring the TEKS to be taught for pre-K. I mean, it wasn't even a requirement. Uh, so in order to get the additional funding, we said, look, you gotta, you got to abide by the TEAC. So we didn't even know if, if school districts were doing that, number one. And again, we were putting $800 million into this program, not knowing any, any type of results, not even knowing the class size. You know, we did a bunch of data collection things to gather some data and some information so that we could actually go, oh, this is working or it's not working. I mean, here's the facts. I've sat on, you know, I was on school board for six years. I was, I've been on the public education committee for the last six years. I've heard it all. I've listened to it all. I understand, you know, I, I, I understand most of it, right? Um, here's the reality of the situation. The earlier that we're able to capture a child and, and start letting them learn in a controlled environment, um, that is going to then push them forward into kindergarten, first grade, and second grade, the better it's going to be. I mean, that's just a fact. I mean, you know, it's, it's, I've listened to people, and we had the debate on the floor that, you know, pre-K is a waste of time and everything else, and, and statistics don't show that. It's just a fact that the earlier we're able to do that, and if we can align to the teach, and we can get them into the school, and get them into the environment. And again, yeah, I mean, I understand that there's the push for everybody to have it, but, you know, if we, if we think about what we can focus on, what we have the resources to spend on today, we're going to either spend the money today, or we're going to spend it in the future. I mean, that's just for the remediation and everything else that goes with it. So, um, you know, the fact that we're able to get them aligned, the fact that we're able to get them into the right environment, uh, to make sure that, that, that their learning uh, makes the most sense. The other thing that we did that was interesting this last session is that um, we also uh, partnered with the private providers, and we said to the private providers, look, you can qualify for fast growth school districts. I represent a lot of fast growth school districts in the suburban Houston area. And one of the things that we looked at is said, you know, even if we wanted to get more kids in the classrooms, we can't. There's not enough room. There's just not enough room and capacity to be able to deal with these kids. You know, there's just, we're, we're, we, we can't keep up with the growth. And so we said to the private providers of Primrose, kids are kids, et cetera. Hey, by the way, if you guys go and get trained and get your teachers certified and, and, and start teaching the TEKS um, and learning this stuff, um, it's going to not only help you because you can get paid for that, but also helps our school district because our superintendents, the smart ones, are saying, it doesn't matter where that kid goes to pre-K. They're all going to be his kids, right? I mean, 97% of them. So the ones that go to charter school or to homeschool or you know private institutions, um, the rest of them are going to be pre-K or K through 12 uh, kids. And so we have a responsibility. Superintendents have responsibility. School boards and the state legislature has a responsibility to make sure that the material that we're learning is is aligned with the K through 12 education at the earliest possible. I do want to talk about that tension, though, because there is a bit of tension between the districts and between pre-K for SA. And, and Councilman, I was wondering if you could talk about that a little bit. And I know that the, the centers, they, they pull some funding from the districts, and, and there's been some criticism from, from the districts over that. Well, the funding that we've allocated uh, is certainly uh, not a tremendous amount of money when it comes down to the amount of need. We've all identified that. Uh, when you talk about the number of children that have been served, there's not enough money to go around, so we've got to find additional funding sources. Uh, I think part of the anxiety for the school districts, and, and, and uh, much like was said earlier, I've spent a lot of time in the public school system on the school board. I uh, had a chance to uh, be president of one of the school districts here in San Antonio, the largest school district in the area, and always had issues relative to funding and who was competing for those funds. And from that perspective, I could see that there is anxiety when other people are in line to per perhaps get dollars that might have been directed to in your, uh, uh, you know, towards you. Uh, so there's a lot of anxiety there. 
But I believe what's happening now is because with this program, we did a very conscientious outreach to the ISDs and told them, this is a partnership between the city of San Antonio and the independent school districts. Not the charters, not to say that we don't want to partner with them, not the private schools, not to say we don't want to partner with them, but this is specifically a partnership between you and us. Without you, we will not succeed. We have to be very clear with that. And I don't know that that message was uh, immediately uh, appreciated or believed. Uh, well, I'm sure you're telling us that, but it's just a way of you taking away money from us. I think at the end of the day, what they're finding is that the perform performance that we're able to achieve uh, is becoming a benefit into the uh, uh, K uh, and beyond uh, uh, public school system. I think they believe that we indeed are, uh, are a partner with the school districts, with the independent school districts. Uh, and I would remiss, be remiss if I didn't recognize that Kathy Bruck is in the audience somewhere. I can see her, but I know I saw her earlier. The fantastic, the fantastic job that she has done to communicate that partnership with the ISDs. I know that she came from Harlandale, my alma mater, Harlandale ISD, uh, with that kind of a background. And it had to be that level of relationship, say, trust me, I'm one of you, and I am here telling you what this is. I think the other person that needs a lot of recognition is Cheryl Scully. Uh, when we laid this on her desk, and uh, when uh, former Castro, uh, Mayor Castro uh, said, we're gonna head down this path, it was one of those, oh my God, uh, is the city prepared to be able to bring in the subject matter expertise to execute this? And quite honestly, no city has it on their staff, right? We just are not ISDs. So what we had to do was lay the charge on her to go out and do the recruitment, we did. And we were able to partner, and I think the ISDs have believed that. I think there's still some skepticism on that, that they feel that we've kind of gotten in front of a, a funding line uh, that is diminishing and, and difficult to get. Uh, but I believe, after now being at it for several uh, years, uh, that they believe that we have a partner. And I hope that that anxiety of us taking their dollars uh, has been alleviated. I'm also hearing some nervousness from the districts about losing good teachers to pre-K for SA. The salaries are higher, and, and I know that that's a concern for... Well, for I mean, and that's true. And the answer is, you know, back to the formulas that are set at the state and the federal level about how we pay the teachers, how we go, do, all, uh, do all the, uh, uh, the formula distribution of dollars. Uh, we aren't necessarily tied to that, but I think that this model underscores the fact that if we pay a professional salary, we will have professional performance. We now are not paying professional salaries and getting professional performance. Can you imagine if we did it, if we did both, both facets of that? Uh, so I believe uh, un un undoubtedly that we've got a model that works. There are probably some improvements that could be made to that model. Uh, there are notions, uh, for example, the concept of looping, perhaps taking some of the children, some of the teachers that are in the in the pre-K that have had the experience and then moving them into the school districts. Logistics are a little tough on that, but being able to have them move with their children and not have that discontinuity of when I've got them in pre-K, then I get them into kinder, somebody else, another very uh, competent individual is gonna go in there and hopefully take that lesson plan and implement it correctly with that child. If we had some methodology of keeping those teachers with those uh, and we were able to figure out the logistics of it, that, that may be help helpful. But those solutions are not gonna happen by virtue of the city sitting there thinking, uh, uh, thinking through it. It's gonna have to be that partnership with the school districts uh, to figure out how we're gonna make uh, improvements to the program. And indeed, at the end of the day, uh, uh, when we, the city, get them back after they get out of their 12 or 14 or 16 years of education, that we have a place to put them here in San Antonio within our workforce that's meaningful, that gives them an opportunity not to be arguing and fighting for and, and, and looking for minimum wage jobs, but indeed have a uh, quality of life wage that they indeed can have one job, be able to perhaps give back to their family and not have to be off running a second or a third job, but be able to go out and participate in schools, participate in the PTA, do the kinds of things that good parenting uh, uh, tactics are. Uh, that's a long-term play. Uh, we're certainly hopeful that we, we're going to be successful. And at the end of the day, I don't know that we'll know the real answer. I think we'll feel good about where we are for an awful long time, uh, but we really won't know the true answer until these folks actually, these young kids actually hit the workforce and they're able to be productive and move our, our, our nation forward. Sure. And Dr. Doggett, did you want to add something? One is, I want to thank you for what you all did in the Texas Senate and the House. 
and because it was a really good step. We finally got preschool and early childhood back on the agenda. But I want you to know it's only the first step. We have a long way to go. <laughs> Same thing with San Antonio. I think what, what, what's happened here is just, it's been incredible. It's so exciting to go around the country and be able to brag about San Antonio. But it's only a first step. We, we know there's money for three-year-olds that can be pulled down. It's sitting there at the state, and you can pull it down. Uh, we know that most children are out there in child care centers, and so uh, the representative had a really good point um, that we need to use a diverse delivery system that's in place, because lots of kids are out there, and if we can improve a setting in a child care, se uh, in a child care center by adding more money for threes and fours, then we will improve it for the infants and toddlers as well because you'll have certified teachers there. You'll have training. You'll have, we'll start building the system that we, we really don't have. We don't have a system right now. We have a conglomeration uh, that we're trying to piece together. And there's no wonder that there's tension in the system because we're all fighting for money and the, the whole system is underfunded. Right. And do you think that one year is enough? I mean, we're talking a one year program right now. and I, is that enough? No, it's, there's no silver bullets in this. And one year is very, very important. And we fought really hard for it because we, we thought that was a place to start. But it's just a starting point. And we need to do threes. And we need to do uh, infants and toddlers. And then we, we talked a lot about family engagement. That's critical. We want families engaged in schools. But we want families talking to kids the minute those babies are born. We have a new baby in the Doggett household. Uh, my daughter has a, a new baby, and just to see the amount of what he's learned in seven months, he's now sitting up, and he has his prefer, uh, he pr prefers certain people and certain things, and <laughs> certain foods, <laughs> and, uh, you know, there's so many babies born where the parents think, oh, they're just a baby, I don't need to do anything, and they get ignored, so we have a long way to go. We've taken a good step at the state level. We've taken a good step at the city level. We're working on the federal level. We have a long way to go. Right. I was going to follow up with that. Is is this something that makes sense at the, the local level, the state level, the federal level? We need everybody. We need all all systems. Got it. Do you agree Emily, with that, Emily, if I could add, you know, one of sure, the things absolutely. that's baked into this SA program is we have competitive grants to allow for child care centers, for example to apply for these dollars that we have to be able to provide additional training. Because we know that um, in order for the entirety of the community to, to reap the benefit, everybody needs to have a, a higher level of ability to be able to teach these young people. And so we are in the midst of uh, these competitive grants. This will be the first year that we're awarding them. Uh, the parent engagement, again, a very, very important part. So it's a multifaceted opportunity that has quality, high quality, full day baked in from the very beginning. And so it's a very innovative model and one that we think can be replicated and should be replicated. But of course, at the end of the day, we'll know if it works when we measure these young people uh, in the third and fourth grade to see if indeed it has translated through. Uh, we are confident that it has, at least our initial numbers have shown a very positive, strong results that these young people uh, coming in have uh, enhanced skills going out. And so we just need to keep pushing that. We've got a fantastic cadre of teachers and administrators that are responsible for the program, and we're very confident that we'll continue to show that uh, throughout the entirety of the program. And do you think that the business community is on board for the, the long haul here? I think we are. Of course, we'll know in 2020, we'll have to re-up the, uh, the tax in 2020, so it'll be an election. But all indications that I've seen as a member of this board is that we are on our path to really showing improvement, really helping to improve the quality as a whole uh, in, throughout the system. And with the ISDs as partners with uh, small businesses that are providing child care services as well. So I think over time we'll be able to make a very strong case. These things are never a slam dunk cover when you go to the voters and you have to really implement and show that we've made a difference and I'm very confident that we have and we will continue to. Emily, the, the business community has actually changed the whole conversation. There's a Council for Strong America and Ready Nation at the federal level, there's Raise Your Hand Texas, there's the chamber, which here, and, and Charles Butt, who just absolutely put this agenda on yes. the table. Those of us who've been working in the field for a long time thank the business community and know that they were the critical feature that really uh, made us go in a different direction. Yeah, Emily, and if I can just kind of comment sure. on that. Uh, clearly, uh, 
the measurement uh, is going to be vital for it to continue to succeed and to be uh, continuing to be accepted by the business community. Uh, I think some of the levels of anxiety that I get whenever we talk about measurement is we're putting out a product, uh, we know how it's measured, and there are a million ways to measure it. And the difference between the measurement of the educational community and the measurement perhaps from the business community and others can be different. And, and while we may say this is a successful initiative, will the community buy off on it by saying, for example, uh, uh, in the short term, it's very difficult to measure this, but one of the, I remember startling uh, facts that was presented to us during the Brain Power Initiative uh, the discussions was um, a measurement that said the state of Texas, and I didn't do fact checking on this, so I don't know if this is true, but this, I'll certainly repeat it because it was impactful to me. They said that the state of Texas does its uh, prison bed count forecast 10 years out, and it's predicated on third grade literacy rates. So if kids aren't reading by the time they're in the third grade, effectively, if, it's, if the literacy rates are dropping, they need more beds. And so there is a clear measurement that we all recognize problem is we won't know that for a decade. And so if we start putting too many, uh, uh, if you will, uh, pass-fail measurements on this, we'll lose sight of the fact of this is an initiative for one year with children in pre-K. We've got to figure out how we're going to, once we get them out, out of the third grade, reading it at or above grade level, how we reinforce it between the third grade and the sixth grade, which becomes critical. Now you're talking about a lot of other issues like potential dropout, things of that nature, um, uh, hormonal things that happens to kids around that age. And then you get to the point of getting into high school. How do we get them into college and graduating college or technical schools or vocational schools or whatever path of additional education they're going to need? But all that's going to be predicated on cities and municipalities creating a workforce or a job environment that they're willing to pursue and that we have a, a workforce. So, Measurement is going to be incredibly important. My anxiety is that we put some measurements in 2020 when we get ready to redo this deal, if we do it, uh, that there will be measurements that will not have been achieved yet because it takes time. This didn't happen overnight. We can't fix it overnight. Uh, but I think, uh, uh, you know, I think we're well on our way. Right. I think one of the issues if you scale something like this is how do you preserve quality and, and access? And I think right now, since it's local, there are things like cultural competency, um, efforts to reach out to bilingual parents, for instance, and how do, you, how do you scale something like that when you're looking at different communities across the state or, or the country? You know, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And again, uh, we're, we've got a couple, a couple of thousand kids in our program. Uh, that's a lot of kids uh, if you're the one taking care of them. That's not a whole lot of kids when you talk about the total scope of what's in San Antonio. And then, you know, multiply that from a scale perspective, the rest of the state and certainly the country. So. Uh, we've got a ways to go, and whether this program would work on a larger scale, I mean, I guess still, still needs to be accepted. I think people are saying that it can, and all we have to do is take exactly what we have and make it larger, and it'll be more effective. Well, it certainly will be effective, but will it be, will it be maximized? Uh, uh, I guess that remains to be seen. A lot of hard work, and I think we can get there. And Emily, you talked a little bit about cultural competence, sure. and one of the things I think you're doing in San Antonio, we're certainly doing it in Austin and around Texas and, and around the country, is dual language learning programs. Uh, our, my older granddaughters has, are fluent in Spanish. They started off in a dual language public school in Austin, and uh, they had do half the day in Spanish, half in English. When they're in the Spanish portion, the children who speak Spanish fluently are their tutors and help them. When they're in the English portion, they're able to help the other kids. It brings some diversity in, some economic diversity, which we talked about in the earlier uh, panel. I think that's critical. It's something we're not looking at too much. We know we all learn so much from each other. We know that kids learn a lot of language from each other. And so I'd love to see a lot, of more, a lot more dual language programs. I also think it's a way to get uh, you know, middle income, upper income families back into public schools and a way to integrate some of those early learning programs where kids can learn a language just like that. Right. And in a moment, we'll begin to take a few questions. And so while you formulate your questions, I'll toss a final one out here. Do you think that the full day programs are critical? Or is, is a half day enough? I think the research is, is pretty clear that full day is important. Uh, it's, it only works, though, if it's a quality program. 
full day of a poor quality program is not that great. Uh, most parents are now working, so if you have a half day program, what do you do with the other half day? It creates all kinds of problems for parents, and then we don't have as high enrollment in our pre-K programs if they're, if they're part day. So I think we need to move to full day, but we need to make sure that that full day is a really great learning environment. Do we have any questions in the audience? Good morning, uh, my name is Kiyomi Holgrove and I'm assistant professor at Texas State University. Um, I'm really interested in um, Latino immigrant families and the relationship they have with uh, the schools in the United States. We know that 25% of the children in the schools are actually children of immigrants. So my question to you is how do you uh, listen to the Latino immigrant families or immigrant families in um, how do you make sure that you meet their needs, not only linguistically, but in a way that they can actually be successful in the United States? Thank you. You know, I, I'll answer part from a state perspective. Um, you know, I mean, I think that's more of a global question, how are we meeting the needs of, of immigrants, Latino population, et cetera, et cetera, that's coming in. I mean, clearly we have, you know, ESL programs that are in the state of Texas, bilingual programs. Um, uh, you know, those are, those, are, those are critical, but, you know, if you talk about early education, you know, those, that's one of the groups that qualifies for free pre-K education if they're an ESL learner. And so, you know, we do spend a lot of money on that. You know, remember what I said early on, which is that if we don't pay for it now, we're going to pay for it later. And the economic impact is significant, very significant, especially if, um, you know, they don't even go to kindergarten. You know, let's say that they just show up in first grade. Uh, it's, it's, it's a huge problem. It's a drag on the rest of the kids in that. So we spend a lot of money uh, from a state perspective on that. Um, and then depending on, you know, the, the, you know, where the kids are at, you know, depending on what school district they're in, it could be a, a, a very high population of ESL students that are out there. Um, and so, you know, those are weighted. But as we go into the next legislative session, you know, we've got a little school finance lawsuit that we're going to have to address. <laughs> Uh, and that's going to be one of the issues, you know, because the weights are very old. You know, everything that we've done is, 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 is you know, 20 plus years old. We just keep putting band-aids on it. That's going to be one of the issues that we're going to have to address as we move forward. Um, and, and we recognize that, that it's going to be critical and it's going to be important. Um, and, and so we are being very responsible and taking the initiative to make sure that we're doing that. But, you know, we can get those kids, certainly at a very young level, a very young age, rather, into the programs, into the right programs, and teaching them, learning them, and getting them, you know, you know, learning English. You know, that's going to be the, that's going to be the key. And so we are very conscious of that. We probably have time for two more quick questions. Sure. Just wait until you have one more to say. Sure. Good morning. I'm Laura Vaccaro with Valera Energy, and I have responsibility for for funding through the Valera Energy Foundation. So I'm I'm obviously very interested in. Outcomes. You've all been talking around about outcomes and engaging the business community. You talked about what do we need to do between now and 2020. I think this outcomes discussion will be critical. So what specifically are you measuring? What infrastructure do you have in place in terms of the children's achievement as well as the teachers? You've talked a lot about quality. How are you measuring quality of, of the teachers in the program that you're doing now? Well, uh, there are obvious uh, measurements that have to happen at the state level because this is an independent school district. It's, these classrooms have to abide by state and federal laws. So we're certainly measuring all of those components. Uh, the other, and, and, and I can't overstate it, and I don't think in this audience uh, it goes uh, without being recognized, that the biggest measurement that we probably don't have a good tool to measure is the parental participation. Uh, you know, there's no, there's no standard at the federal or at the state level to say, you know, what, what a parent has to do to be deemed as a engaged parent. Uh, I think that that's going to be, on, uh, without question, the biggest success component. At the end of the day, when we start looking at this several years down the road, we say, because we were able to get parents more engaged and more involved, we were able to teach children and then have it reinforced at home. Not only did we do that, as I mentioned earlier, we were able to generationally make a difference because that child probably has a brother or sister coming up behind them. Uh, I just don't know how we're going to be able to measure that and invalidate it. Uh, we can certainly make the story and make the case and give uh, examples to make everybody feel good, 
but to be able to quantify that, I think it's going to be difficult. And that's why I said earlier, one of the anxieties that I have is as we start to measure this to say, we're going to do it again, that they say, but you didn't hit my mark. And the answer is, I don't know how to hit your mark. What I would ask then is turn it around and say, you need to have, and like Valero does, be a good corporate citizen, get engaged in that campus, and don't have people tell you how good it's doing. Have your own people come in, validate what the process is, and is it working? And oh, by the way, and if it isn't, they make suggestions and get engaged. That's going to be the measure of success that I think is going to be the toughest to validate and, and to um, quantify. Fortunately, we're out of time here, but thank you all very much for joining us. Sorry and we'll go that. ahead and hand things back to Margaret. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Emily.